Okay, so Kobe tells me we're a little bit behind time, so I'll try to get started. Um, hello, nice to see you. I am very, very, very sick today, so I'm just doing a little intro stuff and dancing around, and anytime I feel like I'm kind of going to fall over, I'm just going to make Aaron jump in for me, which is my way of keeping from having to reverse. So, so thanks, you felt for cool. Um, my name is Thelma, and this is my heterosexual life partner, Louise. Hello. Um, we are regionally known web architects and internet experts. You may have heard of us. Uh, we work for ATT Interactive for Kobe, who is awesome. Uh, and we live up in Seattle, which is rainy and sometimes awesome. So we're here today to talk to you about a couple of different languages. Um, the first one is JavaScript. And uh, most of you probably know about JavaScript. It went through a bunch of different names. It was invented by one guy who was highly, highly stressed and hacked it up in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and we've been living with his mistakes ever since. Uh, it actually started out as a much more schemey kind of language than it did with a C syntax, and it got sort of the familiar look that we're, we're used to seeing slap on top of it afterwards. Um, it has prototypes like some languages, it has C bits like some languages, but it's not really like any of them. So, to give you a really, really quick refresher, um, JavaScript objects are simultaneously hashes and objects. You can get to them through an indexer, just like we're used to getting to things. You can also get to them through something that looks remarkably like a uh, method called us. JavaScript functions are totally free and first class. You can create them anywhere, you can assign them to variables, you can call them through variables, but um, unlike our lambdas, except under certain, certain uh, special circumstances, you can also bind them into an object so that they have a this. Uh, also, JavaScript doesn't particularly have any classes. You can take a function, uh, tell it to pretend to be a constructor, and create new, uh, new copies of this function with its prototypes and stuff like that. But beyond that, it doesn't really have any of the, the sort of class inheritance semantics that we're looking for. So, really, really quick lightning introduction. Um, strange little language that's way more popular than we might have expected it to be based on its origins. But it's very important because it is everywhere. It is absolutely everywhere. It has the widest penetration of any programming language as far as consumer devices are concerned. It's on your browser. It's on a lot of your phones, probably most of your phones here. It is on the moon. Little known fact, lots of JavaScript on the moon. Um, it is in most parents' recipes, which, which I'll call for some level of delicious JavaScript or, uh, or another. I'm not that good a cook. I'm going to spice it up with the JavaScript. The other language that we want to talk about today is Ruby. Um, I guess it's probably safe to assume that most of you know all the, the basic facts about Ruby, so I'm not really going to go over them or anything else like that. <laughs> I'd much rather talk about why these two languages are important together. And you should care because we like the internet. Most of us probably work on the internet. <laughs> Specifically, <laughs> Specifically, most of us probably work on the World Wide Web. And the interesting thing about the web, especially for those of us who are in here, is it really is, there's a great big chasm. There's tons of client-side behavior and, uh, and libraries and everything written in JavaScript on one side. And then we have tons of frameworks for dealing with uh, persistence, with control flow, and everything else on the other side written in root. And these, uh, these two sides, we use them together all the time, every day. We switch our brains between coding for one and coding for another, sometimes you know, a couple of times a minute. But they're very, very different on the inside. And I'm going to high five my partner in crime. High five. Um, for JavaScript, the browser is the runtime. And this is unfortunate to us because it causes tight coupling. Um, JavaScript is very bound to the browser. Um, we can't bring it to the outside world, and that is, kind of sucks. Uh, but the good parts are that we get a sweet standard library when we're working with JavaScript. We're able to modify DOM trees sometimes. And that's about it. Uh, another awesome thing is, I don't know, how many of you guys use uh, package management through JavaScript? <laughs> this, that, package management? 
Also, excellent, excellent command line test frameworks, such as, uh, no, that would be my favorite, this one. Uh, <laughs> continuous integration systems. Uh, I know we use those in Ruby, but you also have this one available in JavaScript. <laughs> That's not my favorite. No, but this one is my favorite. <laughs> But unfortunately for us, everything depends on the browser when it comes to JavaScript. So, we want to free the runtime. We want browserless testing, file system access, easy extensions, and easy experimentation. And this is where you come in. Hi, high five. Great to be here. High five. Uh, so, we wrote something called Johnson. Um, Johnson is <laughs> Johnson is a way of embedding a JavaScript runtime in Ruby or a Ruby runtime in JavaScript. We're not really sure which way it goes, but uh, what it does is it bridges that huge divide between the two languages. Um, you can use JavaScript in your Ruby. You can write a little snippet of JavaScript that will return you an anonymous JavaScript function that will act like a lambda in Ruby land, just like that. You can use Ruby in your JavaScript. You can go the other way and acquire something in Ruby, write a JavaScript function that talks to Ruby I.O., get something back, and does something with it uh, all in JavaScript. Right? John. Yes. Have you ever written a rack app? I absolutely have written a rack app, Aaron. Oh, really? What language did you write your rack app? I used JavaScript for that rack app. Interesting. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> so, anyway, if you guys need a moment, <laughs> we'll, we'll take one for a second here. <laughs> Oh, high five. High five. Um, so the dynamic internets. We all use the dynamic internets when we're working with Rails. We use Ajax, and everybody knows what this stands for. Uh, and another thing that we do a lot that deals with JavaScript is screen scraping. It's not just for huge bags. <laughs> it's, it's mostly for huge bags. Ah, I see. <laughs> Sometimes there are websites which just don't have APIs and we need interact with them, so we use screen scraping techniques to do that. The internets are full of JavaScript, JavaScript, JavaScript everywhere. So what can we do to deal with this stuff? We have tools for scraping web pages such as Mechanize, but unfortunately, given some client-side JavaScript, we can end up with failed results. It's incorrect. But, if, we're in, if we integrate Johnson, we can actually get something for reals. Something we might expect. Thank you, Aaron. I thought. So one of the things that we ship with Johnson is a shell. Um, it's basically just like IRB for, for two languages. So um, just to give you a quick lightning tour of some of the stuff you can do with it, when you start it up, it gives you a JavaScript prompt, um, just as if you were having an IRB one. Uh, when you're in there, you can type any JavaScript commands uh, and get back results in the console just like you'd expect. You can also tell it by typing RB to switch over into Ruby mode, and now you're running against the Ruby interpreter that's part of the second process. In both directions, you have access to the, the other runtime. So here, for example, we're creating a little lambda that just puts whatever comes into it, and we're binding it to a global in the JavaScript runtime. Once we've done that, when we switch back to JavaScript, we can uh, call alert just like it was a JavaScript method and have it, uh, have it call the Ruby code and do this thing. And just like I showed before, you can even you can hop between with, uh, with stuff you wouldn't expect to be able to hop between the 3D pass by reference or anonymous functions or lambdas in, in either direction. Uh, everything that can be is passed by reference, so if you move a, uh, an object across, across the, uh, the divide in the JavaScript, and you bring it back into Ruby, we're not marshaling, we're not doing any copies, we're actually doing reference proxies. And speaking of proxies. Ah, yes, the magic. How does this magic work? It works via Johnson proxies. Now, in Ruby, everything is an object. And in JavaScript, everything is an object too, but unfortunately, the two objects speak different languages. They can't talk to each other. So in Johnson, we've provided a plus nine Acme disguise kit. <laughs> See, we've got objects over in Ruby country and objects over in JavaScript country, and they need to be able to talk to each other. So we use this disguise kit to enable, enable them to speak to each other. 
we wrap our JavaScript objects with the disguise kit such that they can speak to each other when you're in Ruby country. They both speak the Ruby language. When you've moved over into the JavaScript runtime, we proxy, we proxy the objects such that they can speak JavaScript to each other. And this is all done transparently. So you can see here, we've created a new Ruby object, um, put the object into the JavaScript runtime, moved over to the JavaScript runtime, uh, called some methods on the object. The important thing to note is that uh, this was all done, um, what am I looking for? With no interaction from the developer. It's, it's completely transparent to the developer and also to the runtime. The JavaScript runtime does not know that a particular method was implemented in Ruby, and it doesn't know that the Ruby runtime doesn't know that a particular method was implemented in JavaScript. We also do fancy marshalling. Unfortunately, regular expressions, um, regular expressions happen differently in JavaScript than they do in Ruby. So we try to be intelligent about that. For example, moving this regular expression into the JavaScript runtime. We actually move it into a native JavaScript regular expression. We can attach JavaScript functions. So right here we're assigning a JavaScript function in, we're assigning a function to a Ruby object in JavaScript, moving back into the Ruby runtime and then calling that JavaScript function in the Ruby runtime. And from the perspective of the runtime, it's just a, a singleton method in Ruby like we would define on any other post. Now, Attaching to, we can attach JavaScript functions everywhere. So we can even get access to the strings prototype in Ruby. This code here is accessing the strings prototype in Ruby, even though we don't have prototype, prototype style programming in Ruby. So we can define the embiggen method on every string, move back into the Ruby runtime, and we've got the embiggen method in Ruby. And this works the same way in the other direction, although we don't have it here. If you pull out a JavaScript constructor or a class or whatever you want to call it, and you mess with its prototype in Ruby, if you treat it as a hash and assign a lambda to it, then that lambda is available as an instance method of any of the any of the things that descend from that object in JavaScript. So, I think you should talk about some difficulties. Okay. Um, so, as you can see, I'm letting Aaron do the line share where I'm taking like two slides out of ten, which is great because I feel crappy. Uh, I want to talk about a few things that were really, really hard uh, to make you think that we're more awesome. Um, thing number one that's really hard doing this is garbage collection. Um, this is two very, very independent runtimes who have you know, evolved separately and, and aren't the cleanest things. They're certainly not you know, ivory tower projects or anything else like that. So we have uh, GC in JavaScript and we have GC in Ruby. And we haven't disabled either. We spent a whole bunch of time trying to keep them orchestrated which was uh, super fun because they don't use the same garbage collection strategies or anything else like that. So this is one of our biggest stability difficulties uh, that we're still dealing with here. Uh, so garbage collection is huge and it was extremely difficult. It's probably the biggest problem in the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I mean if you think about a, a JavaScript object moving into the Ruby runtime, now you have a Ruby proxy to a JavaScript object. Both of those things need to deal with Ruby's garbage collector and SpiderMonkey's garbage collector. So it was hard. Yeah, especially the second order stuff where you create something in JavaScript, take it across the wire over to Ruby, assign it as a property in the Ruby object, and ends up going back in and being used as a proxy in JavaScript, and it gets very messy. So that's one of the, the hardest places in the world where we're still working very hard. Uh, the other one is thread models. Um, SpiderMonkey specifically uses green threads, uh, and we all know how well Ruby one eight plays with those. Um, so no, it uses native threads. It does use native threads. Yes. But these are things. <laughs> SpiderMonkey uses native threads and Ruby uses green threads. So you can imagine the problems that occur if you do threading in the JavaScript runtime while you're inside green threads in the Ruby runtime. It is bad news bears. Yeah, and this, even with the, the global interpreter locking, so 1.9 is one of our biggest barriers to taking this out of Ruby 1.8. So, I know what you're all, you all are saying. You're not convinced. You're saying that Johnson sounds lame. Well, let me tell you, you're wrong. <laughs> Case in point, everybody recognizes this, right? Fibonacci sequence written in Ruby. Fibonacci sequence written in JavaScript in Ruby. 
Here's an object called tell A, and it has two methods on it. Uh, one of them is the Fibonacci sequence written in Ruby. The other one is the Fibonacci sequence implemented in JavaScript. The client of this class can't tell which implementation is, in, is done in Ruby and which one is done in JavaScript. As you can see, if we test this, uh, both functions return the same values. Which one is faster? You know, I'll be very surprised. I'll let you be the judge. <laughs> Pull down a copy of Johnson, run that for yourself. You'd be amazed at the kind of places where you could, if you were crazy enough, do significant spot optimization for me by embedding a JavaScript interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds crazy. I promise it's true. Would you like to continue? Michelle? Um, I will continue. High five. High five. So, uh, we add a couple of little things just as far as JavaScript libraries are concerned. We add we add very little as far as um, the browser DOM or anything anything else like that that's accessible from the global object by default. Uh, we do add a few little convenience things when you're running these two runtimes together. Um, we provide Johnson.require. What this does is it searches Ruby's load path just like Ruby's require does, um, but it supports both RB and JS files. So from inside your JavaScript, you can do a Johnson.require. Um, you can, I don't know why you want to do this, but if you wanted to distribute uh, JavaScript as a gem, you could very easily do it and get to it this way. Um, we also provide full on-demand access to, to everything in the Ruby object graph. Um, there's a Ruby dot constant in JavaScript, and you can get to anything in Ruby with that. Um, you can get to Ruby dot hash, just like we have there. You can call any of the kernel methods on it. You can get down into any of your classes. We, we translate Ruby constants into JavaScript properties that we dynamically resolve. So anything in Ruby is available under Ruby dot. In that same integration vein, um, JavaScript doesn't have any concept that easily equates to symbols. Um, so we provide a few little extras to help you with that. There's a symbolized method on Johnson that will turn any string into something that the runtime will recognize as a symbol when it crosses the language boundary. And there's also a mix on string to let you symbolize anything. Um, when we originally did this, we actually just had it look anytime strings were coming across the language boundary. And if it started with a colon, we turned it into a symbol, which looked really cool, but really didn't turn out very well in the long run. So it's more explicit now. And then we offer one other little extra um, that can be very useful when you're doing this sort of uh, server side JavaScript, which is to give you another file just like, uh, just like Ruby does. And that's about the extent of the, the language integration we give you. It's, it's a bunch of really tiny things, but they add up to pretty much everything that, that we think you need to you know, write uh, support libraries in Ruby and have them look like any amount of JavaScript. And speaking of that. Uh, my turn. How many of you write JavaScript in your Rails or Sinatra app or Waves app? Sinatra or Waves. <laughs> JavaScript, anybody? Raise your hands. Thank you. OK. How many of you test that JavaScript? Oh, really? Do you, execute, do you execute that JavaScript? How, oh, in, in browsers. You don't have a command line test, though. Well, working with getting away from JSON. Ah, interesting. OK. Uh, what if I told you you could execute your tests in Ruby? <laughs> How much would you pay for this tool? Yeah, how much would you pay for this tool? <laughs> so um, I, I released a new demo last night called Taka. What it is is a uh, document object model implementation in Ruby. So what this lets us do is this lets us take uh, HTML that looks like this accessing the document object model. And because of our transparent proxy between Ruby and JavaScript, we can actually execute this, execute this JavaScript and have it affect the DOM. So, just you don't need to understand what this code does because we've got a slide right here that shows you. All it does is it populates a select a select list in a in a form drop down with a bunch of options. So this this is showing what the DOM tree looks like after the JavaScript is executed. So. Before execution, there are no option tags and that inside that select tag. After execution, there are. With Taco, what I was able to do is create a new Johnson runtime, parse the HTML, 
set and document inside of the Johnson runtime, evaluate everything inside of the script tags, and then execute the onload function inside of the body tag. This actually modified the DOM in Ruby, and we ended up with an HTML tree that looks like this. So we're actually able to assert that the, that, that JavaScript made its manipulations to the DOM tree. So this is, and this is obviously a long way from giving you all the stuff that the browser does, like uh, set timeout or XML HTTP requests, which are actually the, the two biggest, most complicated things you want to implement in a browser to sell them. But we feel like all the tools are there to do that, and what we really like to do is get the same sort of insanely rapid response time with our, our JavaScript tests through auto test or whatever else that we can with anything else. So it doesn't mean that we're not going to use something like Selenium to run the test for you fairly frequently, but with this I can get you know sub-second response times instead of instead of significantly more than that. So yes, talk is released, you might use it. It is extremely alpha software. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, we are also unhelpful. I want to go over a few things that uh, you probably don't need, but I just think are neat. Uh, stupid Ruby JavaScript tricks. Yes, stupid tricks that you can do with JavaScript with Ruby. Uh, you can get database access. So, for example, I'm in this, I'm inside of a Rails project. I run the Johnson shell. I can actually require evaluating my Rails environment and then uh, require a user model, for example. I can uh, switch over into my JavaScript runtime, and um, using Symbolize, do a find all on users and iterate over those, all purely done in JavaScript. So we have given JavaScript database access. Uh, RJS. Oh, that slide is strange. Um, imagine a world where the code was lined up properly. Uh, so we have a normal normal Rails view. Uh, with Johnson, we are able to write our views in JavaScript. So notice that this uh, view is actually written in JavaScript inside of the ER EJS tag. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have no idea why you want to do this. <laughs> yeah, you would want to do this because it's awesome. That's why you want to do this. Actually, the reason you would want to do this is to get locked into using Johnson so that you can submit patches to us. <laughs> and actually, when we, when we had this together, we really didn't have a point. We were working on something that was really highly dynamic um, and used a lot of little interdependent partials. And uh, we really didn't want to, in a lot of cases, have to duplicate uh, rendering updates on both the server and the client. So we actually ended up experimenting with writing a bunch of smaller partials in JavaScript so that we could render them on initial page load and then send them across the wire to the browser so that we could re-render things in JavaScript on the browser um, and not have to worry about doing complex DOM updates or anything else like that. We just bind new data into it and render them, which uh, you know, we didn't take it far enough to do any significant live stuff with it, but it actually turned out to clean up a lot of stuff, as, as bizarre as that sounds. Next up. Breakpoints. Uh, we can set breakpoints in our JavaScript <laughs> with Johnson. So, for example, else was great was, was Patrick Swayze. He was also awesome in the whole break. Oh, you're right. I mean, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Patrick Swayze was actually liked him better than he on it, but Yeah, I mean, it wasn't in a good house or anything. No. no. Exactly, he was awesome. Good points. Go on. Oh, so anyway, <laughs> so back to Johnson. Um, we can compile our JavaScript, give the JavaScript a uh, name, and then we can actually set breakpoints inside that JavaScript. And this example shows uh, setting a breakpoint on line three of this function, which is where um, x gets incremented by two. Um, then what happens is every time that, that uh, line hits, the Ruby block is executed. So we can muck with the runtime inside that block too. So we can examine the values of i and the values of x at that particular point. And, and this is this is nothing that you can't do with something like Firebug, but if you're starting to run browserless tests for your, your JavaScript library, which we do now for certain pieces of JavaScript that don't have a huge DOM dependency, 
it's really nice to be able to actually set the breakpoints in your tests when you're working on JavaScript instead of having to actually run the whole stack. So this, the output from this would look like the from look like this. We're looking at we're actually looking at the i value and the x value inside of the JavaScript runtime. Um, another neat thing is hotruby.js. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of this, but it is a Ruby 1.9 bytecode inter interpreter written in JavaScript. So, for example, these Ruby codes will, uh, we can run those through Ruby 1.9 and pull the bytecode out for those and we get this yucky looking bytecode. But in Johnson, we can require Hot Ruby, instantiate a new, a new Hot Ruby instance, and then evaluate that Ruby 1.9 bytecode. And this gives us the unique ability to be able to execute Ruby on JavaScript, on Ruby, on Rails. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we are just about out of time. Um, we, we pushed out 1.1 to Ruby Forge. It's the first release on Ruby Forge. Um, it's only really seen a lot of use on 1.86, on Mac OS X, and a bit on a couple other units on Intel. Um, stability is something we're continuing to work on because GC is really hard, so you should break stuff and, and help us make it better. Did we mention that Johnson is hard? I, I think we got that. Okay, <laughs> that, was, that was real subtle, and so good job. <laughs> um, definitely want to thank a few folks that have, have worked with us on, uh, on a few different parts of that, um, especially for John Rising for complaining tremendously about certain parts of our, our JavaScript support. Uh, and I definitely want to thank Aaron for helping me because I am really sick, so thank you very much. Uh, so please check it out, help us out. Um, we think that there's huge advantages to being able to do this sort of integration. Um, as much silly stuff as we can do with it, there's some really, really tremendous productivity things we can do. So we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. We have three minutes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Is that imply you could basically execute Ruby programming in your browser with hotruby.js? The question was, with hotruby.js, can I execute Ruby programs inside my browser? And the answer is yes. Well, the answer is kind of. Um, it, it does a fairly good job of interpreting 1.9 bytecode, although you have to actually have Ruby 1.9. Uh, parse and then edit the bytecode for you. You can't just take Ruby uh, source files and, and do them in the browser. It's also implemented about that much of the standard libraries. So you're not going to get any standard libraries. You're not going to get any um, really inheritance or anything like that. You just get the basic flow. It's just enough to say stupid things like Ruby on JavaScript or Ruby on Rails. And that's about all it's useful for right now. Yes? Um, I have two questions. The first one is, have you guys ever played around with this with uh, Steve Yaki's rewriting of Rails in JavaScript? And then the second one, so I think I'm going to ignore for this, is uh, have you guys considered doing anything regarding your interoperability with other languages besides Ruby and JavaScript as far as the cross-language marshalling? Oh my god, so the question was, the first question was, have we done anything with Steve, Steve Yeti's rewrite of Rails in JavaScript? No. Answer. No, you're talking about Rhino on Rails, right? Um, yeah, I haven't even I haven't even looked at, at his code. Uh, and I don't know how much of it. I'm sorry. Be a good test for you. Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't know how much of it is making use of uh, of Rhino's uh, JVM and, and Java runtime integration. So they're probably a pretty significant amount of porting. But we we're actually pretty significantly beyond feature parity as far as language integration is concerned with Rhino, so that shouldn't be a big deal. As far as multiple languages, um, JavaScript was the only one we were really interested in just because it had such, a, um, such an impact on what we were doing every day. One thing we would like to do is let you run simultaneous JavaScript runtimes. Um, so we've been looking at embedding V8 and potentially uh, TraceMonkey as well, which I think would be really nice. Um, we've also looked at a bit at Squirrelfish or whatever they're calling it now. The basic architecture lets you have a bunch of different kinds of implementations, um, but we haven't really looked at seriously embedding anything but SpiderMonkey yet. Have you um, or someone else considered uh, integrating this somehow with Cucumber, uh, the taco piece especially, and the, of course where I'm going with this is that the only place to test round trips would be just called the 
selenium right now, really, and it would be nice to not have to do that. <laughs> so the question was, have we considered integrating this with Cucumber, and it, is, it would be nice to be able to test the Ajax calls. And the answer is no. I released Taco last night, and it is very, very, very alpha. So we, we do want to do that. We originally wanted this so that we could write better integration tests um, for, you know, so more or less the same thing. Uh, that's, that, that's really beyond the, the fun of coding or whatever we want out of this in the long run. That is the future, but we haven't done it yet. All right, I think we're up. One more. Yes, very, I mean, the question was, what are the internals of Johnson? Very quickly right now, it is, it is a spider monkey, C spider monkey embedded with inside Ruby. Uh, the slides about the proxies are very similar to what we actually do. We, we have proxies, two proxies written in C, one that proxies inside of the um, Ruby runtime and one that proxies inside of the JavaScript runtime. So we intercept function calls within either one of those runtimes and then translate them over to the other. And as far as the, the build gym, uh, Spider-Man is statically compiled into the extension and the extension is a few thousand lines of C. Uh, so if you want to know any more about it, you can hit us afterwards and we're a minute over, so we're going to stop. All right, thank you.